Hello, my name is Dr. Alan Kerry. Welcome to another podcast from South Essex GP Training website. With me I have Dr. Sunil Gupta and today we're going to think about domestic abuse. So Sunil, what's the role of the primary healthcare team in responding to domestic abuse? So the role of the primary healthcare team in responding to domestic abuse is to recognise patients whose symptoms mean that they might be more likely to be experienced in domestic abuse, to inquire sensitively and provide a safe and empathetic first response, to understand the practice's process for responding to disclosure and know what to do when there is immediate risk of harm to patients and their children, to know who the designated person is for the practice, to understand the process for arranging the patient's initial assessment with the designated person, to document domestic abuse within patient records safely and keep records for evidence purposes, and to share information appropriately. Information will be shared only with the consent of the patient, subject to practice policy on child protection and adult safeguarding. In exceptional circumstances, information may be shared without the patient's consent. Some cases considered at MIRAC meetings, which are multi-agency risk assessment conference meetings, are likely to constitute exceptional circumstances because multi-agency risk assessment conferences discuss the most serious cases of alleged or suspected domestic abuse. So, so what symptoms might, uh, might indicate that a patient is more likely to be experiencing domestic abuse? What are those symptoms? So those symptoms are things like unexplained symptoms, non-specific symptoms, chronic pain, tiredness, depression, self-harm, genital injury stroke sexually transmitted infections, delay in injury presentation and frequent attendances to A&E or general practice. And what should a clinician do then if a patient discloses that they are currently experiencing domestic violence or abuse? Well, the first thing for the clinician to do is to make an assessment, is the patient and any children in immediate danger? And if the answer to that question is yes, then immediate action has to be taken. The clinician should contact the local police on 999 and initiate child protection stroke adult safeguarding procedures. But if the patient and any children are not in immediate danger, the next question to assess is does the patient have children? And if they do have children, the clinician should talk to the patient about the risks to children and if the children are at risk, initiate child protection procedures. But in either case, they should offer the patient an appointment with a designated person responsible for initial assessment who will assess risk and advise and refer appropriately. Another point to make is in terms of record keeping, it's important to consent to share information or not and ensure information is shared appropriately. You should explain the need to document uh, domestic abuse and document any injuries for the purpose of evidence. You should use a code in the patient's notes to indicate a disclosure of domestic abuse and indicate the risk level if known. You should ensure the patient is seen alone at future appointments, liaise with the designated person and if the patient is assessed to be at high risk, liaise with the multi-agency risk assessment conference coordinator. So who is the practice's designated person and, and what exactly is their role? So the practice's designated person can either be an external specialist domestic abuse service practitioner who undertakes the initial assessment on behalf of the practice and liaises with the GP, or they can be an internal practice nurse or other health professional who is trained to carry out this work. The role of the designated person is when undertaking an initial assessment of the patient, the designated person will conduct a risk assessment, advise the patient about the services available according to the risk level. This may result in one of three things, the patient becoming part of the designated person's own caseload if they are a specialist domestic abuse practitioner themselves, 
or referral to an appropriate local specialist domestic abuse ser service if the patient consents, or signposting to domestic abuse resources and provision of a basic safety plan if the patient is unwilling to engage with services at this time. The designated person should ensure that child protection and adult safeguarding procedures are initiated where required, especially where there is immediate risk of harm to patients and their children. What, does the, what about training requirements? What does the Royal College of GPs advise about training requirements for the practice team in the area of responding to domestic abuse? So the, the advice of the Royal College of GPs, which is on their website, is that the whole GP practice team, clinical and non-clinical, should be trained in how to recognise the signs of domestic abuse, in how to inquire sensitively and safely, and should be trained about the importance of confidentiality and in about the practices process for responding to disclosure. Initial education about domestic abuse can be accessed through the Royal College of General Practitioners e-learning module. This should be complemented by practice-based training delivered by a local specialist domestic abuse service. The training should cover areas like the health markers of domestic abuse, for example, when patients present with depression, anxiety, tiredness, chronic pain or non-specific symptoms. How to ask the question sensitively and safely. The implications of domestic abuse for both child protection and adult safeguarding. How to respond in cases of immediate and significant risk, i.e. where it may not be safe to go home how to document domestic abuse and manage patients' notes safely, the protocols of information sharing, consent and confidentiality, local domestic abuse response pathways for all levels of risk, and the practice process for responding to disclosure to domestic abuse, and finally what to do when a perpetrator discloses or is also registered with the GP. Thank you. So that's training for the practice team. What's the role of management in this whole area? So the role of management is a senior person within the practice should be identified to clarify the practice's response to domestic abuse by finding out what existing domestic violence services are available, by engaging with local domestic abuse services and the domestic violence coordinator to develop an effective working relationship, commission training for the practice team, establish a simple care pathway for patients disclosing domestic abuse by identifying a local designated person who will be responsible for the initial assessment of victims and ensuring the practice's response to disclosure always adheres to its information sharing protocols. And what about the CCG? What should the clinical commissioning group do to try to deal with this issue? So these issues also need to be addressed by the strategic level, by the strategic lead for the clinical commissioning group who coordinates commissioning of services for domestic abuse victims across the local health economy. This could include, for example, accident and emergency, mental health, drug and alcohol and maternity services, as well as general practice. This may well be the same person with strategic responsibility for child protection and or adult safeguarding. Thank you. So in summary, it's important that GPs are able to respond appropriately when a patient discloses to them that they are experiencing domestic abuse. There's further guidance available on the website of the RCGP. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We hope that you'll listen to some of the other podcasts here at the South Essex GP training website.